Okay. Uh, we're going to call the meeting to order, please. Pledge of Allegiance. Daryl, you want to leave it? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we'll start with the announcements. Uh, the regular meeting, uh, select board will meet at 6 p.m. on May 11, 2009, and Tuesday, May 26, at 2009, uh, in 2009. Our work review sessions will be at, prior to that at 5 o'clock prior to the regular meeting. All the meetings will be held at town hall unless otherwise posted. Weather observations for the month of March are available in the town hall. Uh, U.S. Census employees uh, will be visiting every house unit in every neighborhood between April and July. This has already started, just in case anybody has seen them. Uh, and they'll wear official ID badges and. Uh, I think they wear jackets and identify the census. Tax maps and property record cards are now available uh, online at www.plymouthnh.org. Uh, the approval of the minutes for April 7th and April 13th. We have a motion for April 7th. So moved. Second. Second. Moved and seconded to approve the minutes of April 7. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Minutes are approved. April 13. We have a motion. April 13. The work session minutes as well as. Uh, Let's do the work session first. Um, a motion to approve the April 13 work session minutes. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, moved and seconded uh, to approve the uh, work session minutes of April 13. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. The minutes are approved. Uh, the minutes for the April 13 uh, Board of Selectmen's meeting. I have a motion to approve the minutes. Second. second. Moved and seconded. Any comments? If not, the minutes. Uh, those in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? Okay, none of the minutes are approved. Um, so I'm going to move right from agenda review to appointments. Let's see, we have first uh, Officer First class, class Derek Newcomb to Sergeant. Where's Derek Newcomb? Greetings. Hey, yes, sir. How are you? Good. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? I think I have uh, Derek's appointment in front of you. I just got uh, a little bit to tell you about Derek, about his, his performance. I just like to read to the board uh, and the public. Prior to joining the Plymouth Police Department, Derek received a BA in criminal justice from Nichols College. While at Nichols, Derek maintained a 3.2 GPA within his degree. That wasn't an overall GPA. <laughs> While preparing for a career in law enforcement, Derek had the opportunity to participate in an internship with the National Police Department where he earned a very favorable recommendation. In May of 2006, Derek was hired at the Plymouth Police Department and in November of that year, he graduated third in his class of 81 recruits from the police academy. In May of 2007, as some of you may recall, the tragic death of a PSU student who was uh, a victim of a very sensitive assault, Derek was one of the first officers on the scene, a crime scene without suspects and limited witness information. 
Derek's careful and articulate interviewing of those in the vicinity of the crime scene ultimately led to an arrest and conviction in an investigation that would have been impossible to prove. Derek maintained adjunct status at the police academy and is routinely requested a return to help train new police recruits in defensive tactics, and he has recently completed a first-line supervisor's program at the academy. Derek is married. He and his wife, Kelly, I think, closed on a home in Ashland today. Welcome to the mortgage world. <laughs> um, they have a four-year-old daughter named Bella, who I think is here. There she is. Six months ago, I came to this board to recommend that Derek be assigned the position of supervising officer, an assignment reserved for the grooming and evaluation for consideration of promotion to the rank of sergeant. Although this may seem like a fast track for Derek, Derek's education, training, performance, and commitment to the profession are all indicative to the leadership quality we are looking for at the Plymouth Police Department. It is with great confidence that today, that I report that Derek has successfully completed this evaluation uh, period. And in light of that, I recommend his promotion to the rank of police sergeant. And before you, I have that uh, appointment. You have the appointment, Peggy. Sorry, Derek. You just need to go. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I move we accept the uh, promotion of Derek Newcomb to sergeant. Second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. Congratulations. Thank you very much. He's not a, he's not a sergeant yet. <laughs> he's got a sword. Where do you get those stripes? I'm going to ask that uh, Derek's wife, Kelly, come up to uh, <coughs> pin on his badge, and then we'll have uh, Tom Kirk come on and switch. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to pin it to his back book. You know. I'm Derek Newcomb. I'm Derek Newcomb. You solemnly swear. You solemnly swear. That I will faithfully and impartially. That I will faithfully and impartially. Discharge and perform. Discharge and perform. All the duties incumbent on me. All the duties incumbent by me. As sergeant. As sergeant. According to the best of my abilities. According to the best of my abilities. To the rules and regulations. To the rules and regulations. Of the Constitution and the laws of the state of New Hampshire. Of the Constitution <laughs> and the laws of the state of New Hampshire. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, we have Stephen K. Herson, PSU part-time police officer. Is the chief here? There he is. Good evening, everyone. Yeah. I'd like to present Mr. Stephen Herson of Whitefield, New Hampshire. Steve is a retired New Hampshire State Trooper. He retired in January. He, that was long enough break for him, and he would like to keep his hands in the, in the profession. Uh, I think something that Steve will bring both to the university and to the community as a whole is he's been very committed to the youth in his community for a very long time. Uh, he's worked with uh, with varsity athletes at the high school, and you know Steve wants to share a little bit uh, more about that. Uh, with you. He's certainly welcome to. We uh, will use Steve as a part-time police officer and he's going to make a lot of incumbent officers happy because he wants to work midnight shift. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to present Mr. Stephen Herson. Uh, yes. uh, I worked with uh, kids in high school with Jimmy soccer coach for the last three years. I got volunteered for that when I didn't have one. I'm also an assistant by Steve Kelly Chilworthy, baseball team, both varsity and junior, and we do a softball team, varsity and junior. Um, wife wants me to go back to work. <laughs> One winner in Whitefield will do that. Uh, yeah, especially race. when she's a slight so. <laughs> there you go. Well, welcome aboard. Mm -hmm. You have to take a vote. Uh, Make a motion that uh, 
Let me uh, appoint Mr. Henderson to the PSU part-time police officer. The part-time police officer. Second. Second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, Very good. Second PSU part time officer, uh, Randall Avery. These guys are all kids. What are you doing? Well, you know, a lot to be said for experience, Mr. Brown. Um, we're, we're very happy that, uh, that uh, Randy, and, and that's what he commonly is, uh, goes by as Randy, uh, has, has decided to finally. Uh, accept our invitation that uh, we've been extending for about the last year and a half. Uh, Randy is a longtime resident of Holderness, and uh, two years ago he retired as the deputy chief of the New Hampshire Liquor Commission Bureau of Liquor Enforcement. So he knows our community, he knows the problems of alcohol as it relates to college students, he brings a lot to the table, and we're very happy to have him. Randy, you want to share anything with the board about yourself? Feel free. Uh. Well, I, I worked for the Plymouth Police Department uh, from 1975 to 1984, so I'm very familiar with the community and uh, the school itself. And uh, I was with the Liquor Commission for 23 years. Yeah. I tried the private sector for a short time, <laughs> Mr. Berman. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, with the economy the way it is, it didn't work out. I, I tried retail. Um, it's very difficult. I have a new respect for people in retail. And fortunately, I'm back in law enforcement, so. Well, good. Uh, Welcome aboard. Well, thank you. <laughs> vote, Mr. Chairman. I uh, call for a vote for Mr. Avery's uh, appointment. Uh, you want to make a motion? John? Make a motion that uh, point to the uh, part time police officer of PSU of uh, Randy Avery. Second. Second, we moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to thank the board for all the points. Obviously, we put them to good use for the spring fling that starts Friday night. That's right. Oh, yeah. Friday night. <laughs> Very good. I thought we got to jump on it this weekend. Hello, <laughs> Frank. <laughs> All right, we're going to have a little update on the. Um, uh, we get a much notice uh, to the public and the merchants on Main Street as soon as we can. The towns. Uh, this is on the uh, reclaiming of. Uh, Main Street, which I've been told by Paul will involve resurfacing from Court Street to Anderson's Bakery and then from there to Rite Aid will be reclaimed by grinding up the surface. And yeah, Mr. Heath, come on. Yeah, okay. By definition of the word, it's not reclaiming. They'll go down a few inches and take the asphalt off for sure. Yeah, they're not going to take any concrete though. No, but I've got slabs on the roof off the But it's okay. better than what was going to be done. Let's have Mike come up and explain to us what's about to happen to us. <coughs> That's our cross for doing this session. Good evening, Michael. Good evening. How are you? <coughs> Charlie, I wish we could reclaim it, but we can't. And uh, we're going down one inch with the coal grind. I'd like to update the board on what I found out today. Um, a plan to start the project uh, first week of June, and it will be at the most a three-day event. The first two days will be coal cleaning, and the s third day will be the uh, overlay. I'd like to express to the board that uh, there will be inconvenience to people on that part of Main Street as far as parking, I suspect that many times you won't be able to park there. And 
there's not much we can do about it. Yeah. Who, who, down where, well, under Demi Chevrolet, in, 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 down in that little parking lot, can people park down here? Down on the, or across the street from the back door of the Lucky Dog. Oh, yes. Yeah. Quite a little packet. Yes, and Green Street, well, and yeah. many places on yeah. Green Street itself. Just as you get down over the hill, it's a flat. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of parking area down there, okay. which is quite a walk for some people to come up that grade. But there will be inconvenience for the merchants, for the customers, and uh, I don't really see any way around it, but as I said, it's, it's a three-day event, so they can come in and getting out as quickly as they can. When's Motorcycle Week? It's uh, the third week, I believe. Third week, week. yeah, you're away. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll have it all done by then. So it'll be the Chief of Police will be responsible for getting everybody off. And Once they claim that as a work zone, they have the right to have vehicles towed at the discretion. Yeah. And obviously, we're trying to we're going to work around everybody we can, but there's times when cars will have to go. Oh yeah. Well, we have flagmen, or will be state. They flagmen. are doing they're doing flag uh, pike industries. So the only thing that'll be involved if there's anybody who leaves their car there overnight, they start all out. So yeah. those businesses, we will we notify all those businesses yeah. that. Two days before to tell the employees. Oh yeah. Customers. <coughs> yeah, I was already in contact with many of the merchants, but there wasn't a specific date till today. But I've been giving people a heads up. It's going to be early June. But it's three days. Three, three days bad. on that section. Can we go over our cost? The cost of the time. <coughs> we got this is the contract that Pike gave us today for our part, our portion of the job in conjunction. With Pike, that's twenty-five thousand eight hundred and six dollars and twenty-five cents, not to exceed that amount. And I believe that's a very good price because we're coming under the state bid. If we went out and did it ourselves, it would be considerably more, and would be inconvenient because we'd have saw cuts. This, this, well, the way they're doing it, can complete overlay, and that includes. Taking out the asphalt. That includes removing the asphalt. Up to Anderson's Bakery? Yes. Up from Anderson's Bakery to Courthouse? They're doing a cold grind just for the 22 just feet? 22 feet. And just overlaying the rest. No, no need to uh, cold really? grind up. Really 22 feet. What's that? That's, the, That's the state road. road. They'll still go down the center 22 feet. They're still going to grind the asphalt yeah. 22 feet okay. from Anderson's Bakery to the courthouse. Oh, all right. But on the two wings, we just, just get one inch over. Okay. They didn't feel that was uh, necessary to. Uh, because they've already, Charlie, they've already taken out the concrete from Anderson's up. Yeah. So, it's, uh, and there'd be nothing on the post office side of the counter? No. No. Okay, three days. Oh, it's fairly quick. Uh, so I think of the merchants, yeah, they'll just have to figure out the best way they can get their customers in and out. That's good timing, too, because the first three days of the week are usually slow for a lot of that. In June, there'll be none of the kids will be around. Right. The water department had some uh, work they needed to do, was replacing um, some mains, and I believe they've finished that. So they're all set. They replaced mains? Yeah, help sign the movie theater, I believe. Previously, not just for Just the valve. Yeah, there's some, there's some pretty good drainage problems on South Main Street down you know, beyond Driscoll's toward, mm -hmm. mostly on the uh, the river side of the road. They're also addressing the um, fact that some of the our um, surface water goes into their uh, catch basins and they're tying them off so that water won't go to the water and sewer department. But that's going to be reclaimed right up to the curb? Yes. Okay. 
Mike, what about the three monitoring wells that needed to go in? The three monitoring wells, as far as I know, are supposed to be in before this job starts. And uh, I'm quite honest with you, I, I don't know much about it yet, but I'll get on to that. Because they want it done before this yeah. it starts. The monitoring wells are going around the, uh, the uh, laundry dry cleaners. Anybody have any questions? All right, so we're set to go. I'll talk to you. I'm going to be at the uh, water district meeting tomorrow. Right now. And they, are they aware that the, the, that the dates have been set, specific dates? I've spoken with uh, Kevin, Kevin. Yeah. and there's going to be further update on if there will be time and funds available to do. I want to do at least 600 feet of the sidewalks. And I, I haven't got all the information back on that yet. How's that going to be pike or is it going to be something else? That will be subcontracted to whomever you choose. I'm going to have four minutes. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Thank you. <coughs> Correspondence. Done. Visitors. Done. Uh, land use permits, rather than go through them individually, as we have in the past, are just uh, uh, they, they will be available for review in the lobby of the town hall. The, 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 all of the uh, land use permits that have been approved up to this meeting. That's because of the new position of building inspector. Yeah, we have our building inspector has put this together, and I think it probably has streamlined the meetings as well as. Uh, get the information to anybody that's interested in it. Uh, under Chairman's comments, the only issue we have is that our, we've been advised that health insurance costs for the new fiscal year will be going down by 8.3%. Not an issue. No, no. That ought to be uh, helpful. To explain to the rest of the board members, uh, just to find this out, if I can notify the rest of you, you know, we went from 21% down to 2.2%, and we just received notice that uh, it's going to go down another 8.3%. Hmm. Well, it went down two, two or three like Inside this fiscal year? It went from 21% down to 2.2%. Mm -hmm. It's actually going to go negative 8.5%. Wow. Mm -hmm. So we'll be getting more money back. Mm -hmm. Did they give any reason for that? We've got healthy employees. Like I had explained to you, uh, insurance companies are competing in today's economy just like everybody else. And I'm going to see for the first time that everybody We're, we're getting money back or we're sending less out. We're, we're sending less out. Okay. Okay. Nice. So, the employees were also getting by that too because it's 8% less than 8% of 15% that they have to pay 8% less. So they'll get checks from the insurance companies? No, we could. We could just deduct it. We will always pay them. There will never be any money coming back. We'll just be paying them less. Maybe it will come to that someday. All right. Uh, there are no purchase orders for approval. Uh, new purchase orders. We have uh, the police department, Meredith Ford, $2,564.73 to replace the transmission. Flush cooler lines, transmission cooler, transmission fluid. And that has been signed off on, I think. Chief. Yes, Charlie. Would you like to tell us what this is all about? Well, we have one vehicle. It's uh, it's our late uh, story Philly vehicle. It's an older vehicle that we have tried to keep out of routine police service and really save it for the, you know, the bad weather. It's, it's, I think, five years old. It only has a, just a little over 50,000 miles. It does not get a lot of usage. And I'm suspecting that the lack of usage has been our downfall with this car. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't being used a lot, and we've noticed that the car... Um, you know, it had some maintenance issues because of lack of use. It, it almost sat idle uh, almost all summer long. 
and got very little use. And recently, um, we had an officer who was getting inspected in the um, the station said, take, get a ticket for a ride because he hadn't driven it, had to reset some type of a sensor. And on that little ride, the uh, <laughs> transmission uh, was left in the street. <laughs> so um, I, think what I, will, I, I think what I'm going to try to do is, um, you know, once it's replaced, is get the vehicle to be exercised more often, a couple times a week, put it out. Uh, it's not fully equipped with all the equipment, but when it's working in conjunction with another fully marked patrol car, it's fine. So um, this was an unfortunate uh, result of trying to save the mileage on it. So yeah, 50, what's the average mileage on a regular patrol car? Well, usually what happens is by the time they hit in the 100 area, we usually transition them out to um, other departments. The past couple years, though, we've been getting more years out of a car before they hit that 100 mark because we actually have a few more cars around than we have years ago. Yeah. So even though they get up there in age, they're getting lower mileage. And by the time they hit 90 or 100, they're still in pretty decent condition. They've been turned over. But do we trans transition any of those to the fire department, or is that? I know. I think in the past, I think in the past we may have given a couple to the fire department, but. I, my opinion is they're best given to departments that do not use them in emergency driving, uh, which would kind of exclude the fire department. Um, by the time they, they've hit 100, 100,000 police service, um, they're pretty tired. Yeah. So they're good at getting around town administratively, but I don't think they would be uh, the kind of car you want to rely on, either having them to idle for hours or travel fast at any, any point. Did we sign off on this? Yeah, I think it's in there. I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion that we uh, approve the uh, uh, purchase order for $2,564.73 to Meredith Foy. Second. Made and seconded. Uh, any comments? Uh, those in favor? Aye. Opposed? $2,564.73. Thank you, sir. You're very welcome. On another note, uh, this weekend is uh, our annual spring fling celebration, so I certainly <laughs> welcome any board member to come out and see what goes on in Plymouth from 10 o'clock at night to, to 3 o'clock. Daryl already knows. That's, that, those yeah. are his routine hours of being out anyway. So. But uh, if anyone is interested in coming out and riding around, uh, please give us a call. Randy yeah, Avery, Paul, uh, oh, he's yeah. coming back to that was when, when he was on the Liquor Commission, that was a big event. <laughs> yeah, it was. So. All right. Weather, we're hoping for rain because weather always has an impact. So the more rain we have, the quieter the night we'll have. So we'll have to see you out there. All right. I guess our committee reports. Um, discuss the action of clean at 137 Island Street. Well, the committee reports, Joe. I have a committee report. Oh, you, oh, I'm sorry, this isn't part of the, it is part of the, yes, Valerie. Um, actually, a couple of them. I did go to the North Country Council meeting on April 14th. Um, it was a very brief business meeting followed by an extensive presentation about the North Country Council Brownfield program and um, you know what it can do for us with, in conjunction with DES. But, it was primarily focused on a shutdown mill up in Groveton. Also went to the Campus Community Council meeting on April 21st. Um, and again, the big news there was Franklin coming up this weekend. And finally, I went to a meeting of the Plymouth Area Merchants, which are now working in conjunction with Main Street, um, it seems. And just to let you know, they are going to be, we're going to be seeing decals in the windows of participating businesses, which will eventually be leading to some kind of discounts or some kind of deals for shop local customers. They're trying to basically promote local business. And this is what they've come up with to do it. I just uh, had heard a, or read an article on one of the best ways to help your local economy or help the economy in your area is to 
is to uh, do as much as you can, spend as much as your money that you can in local business. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's uh, in, in doing your banking through community banks. So try to keep as much local as you can, and it really helps helps everybody in the community. This group is really, I think they're they're working together. They're coming up with some some pretty innovative ideas about how they can improve business downtown and and not just downtown, but throughout Plymouth. Um, this is just the first phase of it. I think we're, we're probably going to see more of it. They're working with Main Street. They they are. They're working at least Main Street is helping them with web links and some of the, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, uh, I left out something in our last um, meeting. One of my previous meetings was at uh, Drug Court, Friends of the Drug Court, which uh, was a group of uh, judges and uh, community social workers who are trying to advocate for the drug court that's happening in Laconia or Lebanon? Grafton, Grafton County. Grafton County Drug Court. Um, just a really creative way to help keep the numbers at the jail down for, you know, helps to balance the expansion of the jail with alternative programs. So um, this Friends of the Drug Court program was looking for um, just local people who would be interested in being part of this whole thing. I think, um, Marsha, you're the point person mm -hmm. in the area, so Marsha Lawrence. Um, and then outside of that, Ms. Scarborough and I also attended the Selectman Institute, part of the local government center this weekend. There's four sessions. So our first one was down. That's just covered um, <coughs> right to no laws, uh, media. It was a great chance to see how other Selectmen do or don't do their jobs around the state. <laughs> I have nothing. Uh, I spent the better part of two weeks in Connecticut at uh, uh, my brother-in-law passed away, so I was kind of indisposed for the two-week period. I missed the uh, water district meeting. I have nothing. John? Uh, the planning board has nothing. Okay. That being it, we can go on to other business. Um, I'd like the chief to uh, give us a chief. Uh, <coughs> Cox would give us a uh, little background on 137 Highlands, the actions we're taking. This is a, uh, is it part of an old, uh, this is, used to be a convenience store. It is used to be the not so general store. Not so general store. Now, the not so general store with a roof. Uh, yes, back in the, the file indicates, back in all four when it was, uh, shut down. <clears throat> there was a letter written to the board uh, questioning the hazardous condition of it. Since that time, the last two years with the snow load that we've had, the roof had a partial collapse and this last winter it had a complete collapse which left a parapet wall that measured at its highest point 17 feet. If that is to just fall because nothing now structurally is holding it, if it falls towards Highland Street, it's going to land within 14 feet, that's if not no debris goes, of the white line. Safety zone for a wall like that that we use is at least two times the height. With that, debris is going to be in Highland Street. Now, driving by there, you've all seen uh, children playing around in front of that old store. They cannot close the store up as per requirements of some of the fire law codes because the roof is in. If there's a fire that happens in the uh, dead vegetation that's out around the back, uh, there's codes that addresses that issue. That house or that structure is going to go up relatively quick and I'll just pass these around. Uh, so quick that potentially the, the neighbor's house is going to be involved before we can get a handle on it. Um, just look at that. Chief, what is that like parapet wall? Basically, it's just like a freestanding wall. Uh, it go, when it was designed, it went beyond the roof structure, so it made, made it look like it was a taller building than what it, what it actually is. So if it went up over it, you'd have to drop down to the roof. <coughs> so with that, um, it, my job, I look at it as a hazard. And under the RSA, Chapter 55B, Hazardous and Dilapidated Buildings, is a copy of that. Basically, if the Board of Selectmen, after a building has been deemed a hazard, uh, that they can order the building to be removed, repaired, raised. Uh, and 
I think we're at this point before someone gets seriously hurt. And I believe Brian has already drafted up a letter to send to them. Yeah, let's get started. Yeah. Um, all RSA is dealing with land cases that have built in time delays. In this case, it's 20 days from the date of service. Mm -hmm. uh, this isn't something that would be done by registered mail like I normally do my business, but I have, haven't served. So the clock starts upon that. Uh, I drafted this letter. I'm a, this is just a first draft, but to give you an idea of how it works. Um, basically, I have 20 days to fix it. I base most of the things that I put in here on the zoning ordinance, which is quoted there. And what I did when I drafted it up was just went down through the RSAs that you have and made sure that I hit all the high points on that. Uh, it's very similar to a, a land use citation, but it has to be, there's certain other earmarks in this that have to be hit according to the RSA. And one is the, the service, the other that has to be filed in district court within five days at the, the time expiration. So the second that you guys pull the trigger if you so desire, then it'll start the process. And whenever it, it leaves the sheriff's hand to one of the owners, that's when the clock will actually so start. So this will be served physically on the owner? <clears throat> Correct. Is uh, he in town or is he? No, they're up in Berlin. Okay. So, um, there, there's no... Um, Securing the building, as the chief had said, so he's got to raise it yeah. and take it all off premise, which I put a quote in that. And uh, if he chooses not to do it, then the town can do it because the RSA specifically states that we can recover any fees that are involved in, in cleaning up this mess. How do we do the tax lien? Or? Yeah, with through a tax lien, not only on that property but any other properties in the state of New Hampshire. So it's a pretty heavy tool. Mm -hmm. How big a piece of land is it? Quarter of an acre. It, it's um, it's it's uh, it's not uh, it's, um, not a legal lot. Not a legal lot, right? right. Uh, though it is served by water and sewer, and I don't think that the um, zoning board of adjustment would have too much of a problem allowing somebody to build a single family home there if they could hit the setbacks on it, which they can, which still would be plenty. But now, is there a trail of land? Yes, there is. That's on the same lot. Yes. Is anybody living there? No. This has all been abandoned uh, since the early 90s, I believe. And they've lost all the for their uses, both of the trailer and of that building as a store. Now, is the trailer uh, a nuisance or unsafe? Or I, I, believe, I, guess, really, I, I don't know. believe so. I mean, it's it's secured. I don't know if there's any windows broken out of there. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be a hazard to. Um, other properties or persons, um, just with that wall being that close to the public way. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we issue this letter with um, additions from the fire chief about additional violations as soon as possible. Uh, we have a second. This would be for it'd be, uh, a motion to give Brian a go ahead to, to issue, this. issue the letter. And present it to the owner. Second. Uh, it's with the fire violations as well. Yeah. yeah. So the motion is made and seconded. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Uh -huh. uh, opposed? The motion carries. Discussion. You are here by author. Uh, discussion? Is there any discussion? Yes. Oh. <laughs> okay. The financing of this project. We have to put it upon ourselves to do it. We'll have to find money within our budget. And the way that will happen is we'll have to use the fourth prerogative to pick a line, use that money, and we'll hold the lien as a receivable to replace that line that money comes in if collected. Healthcare has got a little bit of lien. <laughs> Uh, have you got any estimates of the cost of the move this time? Well, well, like any yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, we haven't put Not it out this Is that on a, that's a slab, yeah? But that, we don't sell it on I think it is, yes. I, think, yeah. I can honestly tell you, I don't think we'll be as kind as if the individual was to go out and do it himself. 
No. I think we'll be able, we're just going to go out and get the person that can get it done the quickest and the safest. Right. And they're probably taken care of. It won't be our bill. And whatever that cost will be passed along. All right. Now you can take it off. All in favor. All in favor of the motion to uh, have Mr. Murphy proceed with the a letter to the owner of uh, the 137 Highland Street is with the attachments from the chief. Aye. Say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. You can proceed. And then we'll go after that one on Merrill Street. <laughs> yes. Now, one, one, other, one, one other question. How about the trailer out on Yenton Road? It's a way for your finger check. Trailer out on Yenton Road. <laughs> Uh, he's, that, that property is waiting. It's still on a time frame. Is there as a basement? I did notice them on. I have not heard right. back from the insurance company, and we are. They haven't indicated um, what they're going to do with it, and we're just now closing up the final investigation of that file. So, when I break it, we're going to try to contact the owner and find out what his intentions are. Because he's got six months to fill that in here yeah. or something like that yeah. happens. And I said I would love to remind him of that fact. Mm -hmm. Related question. So six months, is that in winter time? Is that it does it doesn't it's break it out during the either one. Uh, yeah. for the purposes of this order and I did put the date in there, it was March first, two thousand eight, which was now, the first on, of the big on that trailer, it's that close to the brook. Can they can they crush that trailer into the basement? And if it's been damaged because of the fire, he's gonna have to have a cleanup company come take care of it. The insurance companies will be um, take care of it. I don't even know if his insurance company has been notified yet. But like I said, we just closed on on that. I haven't seen anybody, no more questions has come up. So we're gonna make contact with him one little later on. <coughs> Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is one of my pet projects. It's nice. It's yours. It's nice. No, no, use that one. We had a discussion that started in town hall. I, I, went, I went in one day and I started talking. Well, we got a letter from uh, Interlakes. Uh, property manager. And I think they send a letter every year when they send in their inventory forms. And the, the, the thing that hit me in this letter was that uh, these forms are due the 15th of April. And by the 19th or 20th of May, they're obsolete and basically useless. Uh, these are required by uh, statute and uh, however the town does have the option to uh, discontinue them. So I had a discussion with the town planner and uh, the building inspector and a couple of the girls in the office and they pretty much agreed that uh, back and forth that they really didn't, uh, there wasn't any economic uh, advantage to the town to continue doing this. And I think you said Kate went to a meeting administrators and they asked who in the room was still using them and we were the only well, ones. Actually was. after that meeting we went to another one in the Department of Revenue. Mm -hmm. Last Wednesday we were the only ones in the room that still used them. Nobody used them. So we uh, at our work session we discussed this and, and uh, the decision which we'll formalize tonight is to discontinue the inventory forms effective immediately because or not to or not to so with that <coughs> does anyone have any comments they'd like to make uh, this will um this will apply to starting next year right right, right. Okay. yeah this year is i guess brian kate and miriam all receive their information now from other sources other than the inventory forms and i also check with our assessor how much money did um, late fees bring in we have a sense of that it goes from $25 to $50, depending on the amount. Yeah, I mean, what's it cost us? Has anybody ever tried to figure out the total cost of labor? It's, it's weeks of labor, and then there's a, there's a mailing fee, and I believe it's like $3,500 at least. Mm -hmm. and then we have to do it then when they come in, we have to go through them again. 
store them. So there's a while to get them out. There's a while to get them in, retrieve the information off of them, and, and file them away. Is it 3,500 that go out? I believe so. Kay had commented that um, there is currently a requirement if somebody wants to file for an abatement for the current year, they have to have filed this inventory form for the previous year. So something's going to have, there's going to have to be a workaround on that or else there'd be no, and unless we just say everybody can file for an abatement. If we abolish it, wouldn't it, that no longer apply? Right. Right. So. So there's well, nothing to prevent. There's nothing to prevent you from applying for an abatement. <coughs> that, that I was alluding to the fact that we have saved ourselves money once in a while. If somebody forgot to turn in an inventory form yeah. and they filed for an abatement, yeah, we can deny the abatement. Right. That would no longer apply. But I'm not too sure right. how many people would. Yeah. The inventory form would be the key to applying for an abatement or not. Which? No, I don't have a problem with it. No, I think it's a good idea. I just have one quick, and, and Kate says that was something that we could look into finding another method around that. Yeah. That's, that seemed to be the only one positive thing out of it. Yeah. Are these all homes only? They're just no, they're just they're 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 property. Yeah. And, and they, they, the guys that really complain about it are the, the property management companies that student rentals. I've done them for all of mine, but I mean, it's just uh, the, the, the point that came through to me was, was, you know, six weeks after they're due, they're obsolete because the kids go home. And well, well, the other the biggest thing that we have to it, I forgot to mention this, that we can't guarantee accuracy and the truth right, has right. been put on those so, forms. Yeah, if, if you have four kids in a three-room apartment, he's not going to tell yeah, you. We have no way of outside of spending more time than sending somebody out, uh, either the assessor or building inspector or the code enforcement, to see if what they put on the phone is really true. And we're the only town that was still using them? Not the only town. We have to have might already know. I know we didn't want to put hands up. I move that we cease and desist on this document. It's very formed. Second. Second. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> the inventory forms are complete. Um, you want to have Jamie come up on the ball? Yes. Okay. Jamie here? A discussion of the dynamic DNS for the PBK emergency message. Where James? Well, James is coming up. All right, here he comes. He got his little bitty computer there. Yes. So, um, what we're talking about here is getting a, a dynamic DNS for a PB cam. Um, what that means is basically any computer that's on the internet has an IP address. Um, that's a series of numbers that identifies that computer on the internet. Um, right now, um, we wouldn't be going out live on channel three right now if I didn't have internet access to my office from here to control the new server that we just got. Um, so I need access from here and I'm able to do that, but I have to type the IP address in directly. Um, now our internet service in my office is residential service. Even though it's an, an office doing business as part of the franchise, we were, giving, we were given residential service because it was cheaper. Um, what that means is that IP address is subject to, subject to change. How often, how frequently will it change? I don't know, but it's, it's a crapshoot. Um, so what it means is when it changes, I have to change all of my software that's, that's controlling that server. Um, which is a bit of a nuisance for me, but that's no problem. I could do that myself. But now, part of the reason for buying that server was we were going to do emergency messaging. So we're going to give remote access to police, fire, um, town hall, um, possibly highway and the schools, so that when we have uh, fire emergencies, snow bans, uh, on parking, things like that, um, possibly school closings, um, we can get that information on both channels live as it happens immediately. Uh, especially if the departments in question have direct access. It doesn't have to be filtered through me, uh, which makes it a lot quicker. 
but if that IP address is changing um, and I give everyone the IP address and it changes and I don't know it and they don't know it and there's an emergency, well then they can't get access to put that information on. Um, it would require me changing it, then communicating that change to everyone, um, and then they would have to make note of the change, change you know their practices. So what a dynamic DNS allows us to do, there, there are a couple of ways of solving that. We can get a static IP address, which means that number never changes. Um, and there are a couple of ways of doing that. We can stick with Time Warner, who provides the internet service for my office. Um, but in order to get the static IP address, I have to upgrade to business class service. I can't stay on residential. They just absolutely don't do it with residential. So that increases my internet costs significantly. I mean, it goes up $20 a month. Um, and then I'd have to pay an additional fee for the um, IP address, so another $30 a month for the IP address um, to stay the same, so that's an additional $50 a month, which is pretty much doubling my internet costs for my office. Um, I could go with Fairpoint, the, the telephone company, and do uh, DSL to my office instead um, and drop Time Warner's internet access, but I would still have to pay for the, um, the DSL service, which is more expensive than my current service. Um, I would get a static IP address. Um, or the other solution is let the IP address change whenever it wants um, and then use a dynamic DNS hosting. What that does is when you go to a website, it has a URL. It has an address that's words. So you type it in. It's easy to remember because it's words. So for example, the town of Plymouth website is www.plymouth-nh.org. And people can remember that and go to it. And it's the same all the time. Um, even if the IP address changed behind the scenes, you can change that and pe if people go to that address, they won't know the difference. It's always the same. So it solves the problem. Um, dynamic DNS hosting is far more affordable. Um, I submitted a packet of information and you saw the, the service that I found. Um, to pay for a, dom a domain name of our own that would be unique to us and for their, their service for one year is only $33, basically, for the package. That's $33 for the whole year instead of an additional $50 a month that I would be paying for the increased internet service. Um, now, the, there is one benefit to going with the increased internet service that I wouldn't get from a dynamic DNS, and that would be faster internet speeds in my office, um, which might make sense because I'm dealing with a lot of digital video going over the internet. Um, but so far, it hasn't been a problem for me. Um, it hasn't come close to being anywhere near a problem. And I'm regularly downloading video files from other places over the internet and transferring data back and forth over my internal network. And it's not been a problem. So I really don't need the faster we're internet serving, speeds. We're not serving video out. No, we're not serving video out. And if we did go to serving video out, then I would need to consider increasing my internet speed. Um, but for now, it's, it's not necessary. And, Rather than doubling my internet costs and paying another $500 a year, I could pay $33 a year and, and accomplish the same thing. And that would mean I'm giving police, fire, town hall, um, highway, school, uh, the SAU, one web address, never going to change. And the service also gives me software that I put on an, a computer in my office that's constantly running and checking that IP address. And if the IP address changes, even if I'm away at a conference or I'm on vacation, the software changes it for me automatically and I don't have to do anything. So I don't have to change the IP address myself. I don't have to disseminate a new IP address to anyone. It just manages itself. Um, I pay $33 a year, and they're always going to have the same web address to go to um, to update the emergency information. So. So it's your own domain, so yeah. if anything changes, the, the connection is automatically made with that. Right, exactly. And the software will take care of making the change for me, so I don't have to be in the office. And this is still through Time Warner? No, this is a separate company, um, noip.org, or sorry, noip.com, um, provides the service. The service itself is $25 a year, but then um, they do a package deal where you purchase a domain name along with the service, and it's a total of $33, actually $32.95. Do you have any um, information, any, any references as to how reliable the service is? I, I, I know, you know people with Time Warner and Fairpoint you know, problems with internet access on and off. Right. Um, I've done some looking around on the internet and I didn't find any complaints about no IP. <coughs> so, um, 
it, it came up recommended on a number of sites as far as one of these services. I did some searches of forums to find out what services um, offer this kind of, what places offer this kind of service. And no IP came up as a recommended service frequently. So um, that was one of the things that led me to find them. And the address, you keep it pretty quiet, it would just be? Yeah, it would just be internal. So it wouldn't be something that would be publicly um, known. We need a motion to I'm going to accept the uh, or approve expenditure of the UIP option for dynamic DNS hosting of a uh, domain that can uh, help run our PBCAM emergency messaging. And second that. Motion has been made and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? Yeah, so the total amount for the year would be. Um, basically, it would be my, my usual internet costs, yep. um, and they're already padded a little just in case things go up, so I really wouldn't change what I budgeted for internet, because oh. it's only $33 a year, right. so okay. there's really almost no impact on my budget. Any uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, Jamie, you have your DNS. PV cam emergency message. Thank you very much. Dynamic tool. <laughs> uh, let's see. Mr. Keith, uh, explain to us what happened on Route 3. Uh, <laughs> I'm guessing not every one of you have decided to walk through this parking lot and experience what it looks like, so I thought I'd give you a little video. Every, has everybody done that? We have been through. Yeah? Okay. 30 years yeah. ago. 30 years ago. It's changed, John. It's changed. <laughs> um, but I, this is just like a dozen slides just to kind of walk you through my little, <clears throat> my little slideshow trip myself. Um, and I started on Main Street to give us a little bit of a view of <clears throat> approaching the parking lot. And go on, I apologize. This is yeah. headed north. I apologize for the bug splatters on the windshield. <laughs> so you can tell spring has arrived here in New Hampshire. And I did this just over. The, the good news, from my perspective, is it's a very high visibility when you see where the entryway, the new entryway, is located from both the north and south direction, which is, uh, I won't bother, but you can kind of see the road cut right there. When did um, they put the entryway in <clears throat> Was that just done? Just, just last yeah. week, yep. Mm -hmm. yep. We uh, had to get state, yeah. state permits to before we could do that. Uh, this is just an example. This is the shuttle stop that's there now, if you can see that, and that's one of our signs as we're trying to make sure we uh, encourage students not to walk on Route 3, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, this is the new pathway that we constructed. This is from the southwest corner of the parking lot. It runs on Plymouth State property around behind the armory and connects right up to the front of the Langdon Woods Residence Hall, and it's lighted for safety at night. Um, I put this in there because I had a question when we first were going to look at this. I said, what's going to stop students from cutting up through the armory? That's going to stop students from cutting up. This is not a amenable yeah. spot for cutting up there. It's a gully and then that very steep riprap and a fence. So, so that, I thought that was nice to know that that's there. Uh, this is the cut in, the new cut in as you're looking uh, north again over the bridge. And this is where the new shuttle stop is. Paul, I'm sorry, you can't see that very well, can you? I'm used to looking at the <laughs> uh, This is a view with the shuttle, so I, and I thought that was important because it's a quite generous spot. There's a lot of distance there. The shuttle is nowhere as close to the road, and, and the students are well back. Um, and I went last night, actually, because Sunday night, and I'll tell you a little bit about the demographics of this parking lot. This, uh, again, it's temporary. <coughs> August of 2010, we have to give it back <coughs> and restore it to the condition we found it in. And uh, it's for underclassmen. And that's important because these are the students who used to park, as you know, down where the ice arena is going to go. Those are essentially first year students and second year students. Um, and what I always tell parents when they come to orientation and they're fighting with their kids over whether they should bring a car or not, and I always tell them that you can walk anywhere on the campus of Plymouth State University faster than you can go get your car and drive there. And so the good news is these remote lots allow for students who need a car for jobs or to get home on the weekends, but you are not going to go over and grab it for just a little casual joyride because it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, and that's worked out very well for us. Yeah, you really increased the distance. 
you. Well, you, this well, just three. Yeah, yeah the, and, and the good news is that walking on Route Three is not a shortcut to anything. If you're oh, if you're trying to get to the campus, uh, and what I saw last night, which is again a heavy load, is uh, and the shuttle runs every 20 minutes on Sundays as it does during the weekdays, and the students were filled that little shuttle stop. They were all waiting because they know they can't really walk where they want to go, or or they'll be on their way and the shuttle will pass them and they'll say, Why didn't I wait for the shuttle? So, uh, so that's good news. This is a gives you a little sense. We put up a. The, the fence and the, some Jersey barriers to make sure cars didn't get close to the community gardens. And you'll see here that this being the furthest north, north side of the lot, you can see even though it was filled, those are the empty spots. And there's also a large area to the, this side of the garden that um, people will be able to park at. And of course, there's never more than a few cars there, but there's more, way more parking than necessary for them. So it isn't going to interfere at all. Matter of fact, it actually improved the entrance uh, for them. This is a view of the path from behind Langdon Woods. I'm sorry, this is the view from, yeah, that's right. And here's the other direction of it. So you can see it cuts right up into the end, edge of Langdon Woods. And then we have a path that runs behind the building and another path that runs in front and cuts up into the student apartment complex. So it's a pretty direct route. Uh, and I, you can't really see this, but there's the flag of the armory. I just, if you've never been back there, there's a, a very nice natural pond back there that's loaded with peepers right now. And, uh, and it runs behind the armory. So that gives you a little now, video you're, representation. You're going to destroy that path once that temporary arc Yeah, we have to restore it to the condition we found it. That's the lease agreement. So anything we do, we did very little. Um, if you've seen any of the uh, emails or letters from Miriam, you know, you'll probably know that I think we had a, a max of 40 cubic yards of material just to level any low hole kind of thing. Uh, it's a very hard packed area because it's been, as you all have watched over the years, uh, filled and developed to parking lot status from previous enterprises. but So that's pretty much the nature of the lot and the way it's structured. I also brought for you, we've already updated, of course, our maps. There's one other important thing. Uh, this is the shuttle route and maps, which you're welcome to have. Um, just as an added safety precaution, the shuttle loop actually gets on to 93 at exit 25, gets off at exit 26, loops around and comes comes back so that the shuttle is never stopped on route three going north it always is coming south and just pulls right in so that, so we never have any large vehicle stoppage at least not from our transportation system at that location so uh, it was just an added safety precaution how, how much time between shows do um, the schedules there on the weekends it's 30 minutes and all the weekends sundays it's 20 minutes every 20 minutes the shuttle arrives and that's the maximum to be honest with you they usually are in advance of that schedule but they allow like a bus schedule you want to allow for the worst case scenario so um, it's in general my timing of it is it's usually no more than 15 minutes now, did you put a culvert in there, or was there a culvert where you cut into that lot? You didn't have to. No, it was just, it's just, uh, there really isn't any water issues. <laughs> We had the, the state and everyone, safety committee, everybody signed off on it. But uh, there was an interesting thing because we actually had a, uh, um, a historical review by the state because there was some, some consideration that this might have been an Indian mm -hmm. site at some point it's in its history. And of course, we didn't really alter the site. We just filled a few more holes. So what Indian relics may have been there, I think, are long since gone from previous previous excavations, but. Uh, What's the capacity of this lot compared to the one you're coming off? It, it's virtually identical. It's about 372 spots. So, yeah. what, what is the average length of time that car would be set in there? Well, that, that's a good question. It's a good segue, because when I mentioned that underclassmen park there, again, they don't usually use their, they usually sit completely idle for the whole week, and they tend to be used on weekends, unless someone has a job, we do run the shuttle on the weekends to Walmart, so students don't even need a car to get to Walmart. Uh, but there would be, certainly be some shopping trips and things of that sort. But in general, if you watch those lots from Sunday to Friday, the cars are sitting there. As a matter of fact, our bigger issue is if we have a big snowstorm, getting students to move their cars so we can plow the lots. Uh, that's always our greater struggle in the wintertime. But now, do you have any kind of a monitoring system in regards to leakage of gasoline and oil and stuff like that? You mean in terms of spillage and whatnot? Well, if the cars are in there for 
two or three weeks uh, could very well be leaking some stuff yeah, pretty well, close to the wells. I, um, I would imagine it's like any lot that it's going to be passerbys and, and it's obviously heavily patrolled by university police and maintained. I know, I know that was a great concern for Walmart, a great concern for Lowe's. Yeah. And they only sat there maybe 20 or 30 minutes. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, we'll certainly continue to be vigilant, and if anybody sees anything that appears to be an issue, we think we have everything well in hand. Uh, again, it's for essentially a year and a few months, and uh, then the ice, the ice arena, believe it or not, will be open fall of 2010. Now, and all that parking will be, the parking is all restored and expanded. It, those, it, you will be expanding that to pick up these cars that yep. up here? Yes. Yeah, matter of fact, I double-checked that, that yeah. the, uh, we're going to be, you know, obviously some of the parking that's there now will be taken up by the footprint of the building, right. and then the uh, physical plant vehicles are being moved and some expansion of the parking down behind You'll be going there. back behind the physical building? Yeah, cutting into, into some the of fields. those fields yeah, and whatnot. Right. Wow. Yeah. Which has a few people who play on those fields right. a little concerned, too, yeah, but yeah. Um, yeah. price of progress, I guess. Right. <coughs> I don't want to tell you more than you want to know, but I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you anything you like. That's so what'd you say? When the, when's the arena then? Fall of? 2010 it opens. Oh. Yeah, it's a... And which is why we had to move the students now, because the students, as you might imagine, have been asking questions. Why did you make us move? We're going to be gone in three weeks. Why would you make us move now? Well, the reality is three weeks is a huge, huge. this time of year, for those of you who have done any kind of construction work, that's an unbelievably huge amount of time to get. In this case, you'll mostly just see set up staging and site preparation. But uh, it's a very interesting facility. And uh, if you'd ever like to have a presentation on how it's being designed, um, you know, because there are obviously some people concerned you're building what most people would perceive as a very high energy use facility, an ice arena, in the, you know, it's, it's clearly expensive. Um, and yet, some of the things uh, that have been being done there, geothermal, uh, some other things to, to heat and cool the facility that uh, radical reductions in energy costs. I'm not going to tell you that it doesn't use energy, but uh, for a facility like it in its nature, I'd be happy to do a presentation sometime if you'd like to learn more mm -hmm. about the design of the building and how it's being uh, pursued. What's the state of the capacity of that? Um, I think it's 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 not huge. It's I want to say it's That's around a okay. thousand. Uh, in that, I I can bring you back more detail if I do a little follow up presentation if you'd like, or have someone come to do one on the nature of the building. And and it's, I was at a chamber of commerce meeting last week, and it was interesting because there were several hockey family people there who were just so excited that they're not going to be driving their kids all over the world to, to play hockey. So it'll be it'll be fun. And my daughter's a figure skater, so she's excited. So that'll, that, that, that facility will be available for that sort of thing, community? Yeah. Activity. As a matter of fact, its whole principle is as a regional center, and it is uh, what we call an auxiliary enterprise, which means it's a self-funded operation. So it will be no tax dollars, uh, nothing, no anything goes to that other than student fees and revenues that it generates through its usage. So it's being designed and built as serving this region, certainly university students and whatnot, and they're paying the lion's share of it through their fees. Uh, but then uh, a big portion of this is outreach to the community, um, hopefully expansion and development of more uses than we currently have because we don't have those facilities. I mean, you don't really have an ice skating program um, that I'm aware of, you know, other than some, there are some youth hockey, of course, and they travel along, but I imagine this is going to get a lot of people thinking about new and exciting ways to keep youth uh, and us old farts uh, engaged and athletically involved here. Okay. I appreciate your Thank time. you. My pleasure. Thank you. We've been there anyway, so that's okay. <laughs> always, happy, always happy to talk to you guys. <coughs> See you. <coughs> Mr. Heath. I'm going to talk about the highway <coughs> plow truck. I 
have four bids or quotes from four different international dealers. Uh, I've replaced our international truck with another international. And I'll read you the uh, amounts that were submitted. Liberty International in Manchester came in $133,747. Um, we fixed trucks in Littleton, $135,625. Caprazio, down there in Manchester, $136,455. Fourth quote from uh, international dealer in Maine, which is $157,785. Liberty International is the uh, lesser cost, and uh, that includes everybody got an 11 page spec sheet, which I supplied them, so everybody bid on the same apples you might say, no surprises. And the costs include the, the warranty. I got an extended warranty for the truck of uh, 42,000 miles or 84 months. And that includes the whole vehicle, body, chassis, engine, basically everything except the plow and the uh, Santa body. I would like to say to the board that the, we've got a new style Santa. It's a, what they call an airflow body. It does away with a regular Santa that you see in trucks. It is incorporated into the shell of the body itself. So that truck can be used for any type of work needed at any specific time where we don't have to take the Santa out of it. We just close the piece of steel down and it becomes a regular dump truck. Does it still drop it in the back or it drops? It, the, the sand comes out. The sand back. comes out in front of the drive wheels, which is an added safety feature on the truck. And we plan to use that truck on our more dangerous situations. Uh, we can get the truck for approximately $6,000 cheaper if the board wishes to trade in the 94. Um, I would ask the board that we keep it. The $6,000 in today's monies on a vehicle is not a lot of money and that would give us a backup vehicle in case of breakdown. And also, it would allow us three vehicles in the winter to remove snow. Uh, I don't include that in Main Street, but in the side streets. So I ask you that I'd be allowed to keep it. And if not, the uh, price comes down to about $129,218. Which so what one thirty three includes a six K. Okay. What would be the cost of, of bringing that the older truck up into reasonable service? Oh, John, I, I really can't tell you that the guy would say probably ten to twelve thousand dollars. There's a so, lot of rust in it. So if we keep it, instead of 135000 we'll be talking 150000 No, the, the, the total amount for the truck is $133,747. Right. If you, you take the trade out, it's 129000 Right, but if you keep that truck and you spend $12,000 to right. renovate it. But I don't I don't really want to really renovate it to that extent. Okay. I'd just like to keep it as a standby vehicle. Okay. Also, the whole snow and sand and stuff like yes. that. Well, yeah, how many miles does it go? It's over 100,000. I'm not sure. Is it diesel or gas? Diesel. That's not that much. The engine will outlay us the three rest of that. For sure. What goes on is the bodies. Yeah. All right, do motion. we uh, have a motion to, wait, do we have a bid? Uh, no, this is, I just wanted to explain to you where I'm at and when I come before you 
uh, I'll, I'll write up the PO. I just wanted to tell you where I'm at so I can actually get something in the pipeline for an order because okay. we won't get the truck for three to four months. So right. the standard procedure is to order it Why probably, probably the mid and end of May yeah. so that we get it around September. So we'll right. vote on the PO after the issue. Which one would you suggest? <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd like to go with Liberty. Um, obviously, is the cheaper quote, and everybody's got the same spec sheet, so everything's on board as being the same. Where did we, you buy that last one? Where did you buy the last one? We, we, we dealt with Liberty and so and that's a state bid too, by the way. Okay. We came out of the state bid. You, you were going on this one. You got a purchase order coming before you in May. And then we start ordering the vehicles from the new fiscal year. Make a, make a copy of that and just throw it on one of the boxes down there, the specs up in there. Sure. Yeah. 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 I can want the inspection from just the one, or do you want? The one, the one that we sent out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And probably a copy of the results from all, all the four, right? Okay. I don't understand why the guy in Maine's up there. Maybe he's trying to get money back from the New Hampshire taxpayers. I was going to say taxes. <laughs> what was the name of the company from Maine? Uh, Morrison and Sylvester. They're in Auburn. <coughs> Tolls and gas can be worth 20 grand. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll await the purchase order and then vote uh, approve. And you put the PO in with the 133, keeping the uh, yes. truck. Do you, do you, do you want to keep the truck? Yeah, I think that's my preference. I don't know this. Okay. If anybody has a change of mind, they just. It's a, deal. it's a crap shoot. Yeah. yeah. Because next week it can be spent yeah. five thousand dollars. <laughs> Besides, in New England, you never throw away an old truck. You stick it out behind the barn and let it rust into the ground. <coughs> okay. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Fred, you've got to talk to us about the swine flu, which I'm going to ask Mr. Morrison to come up. Mm -hmm. Tom and I are going to update the board and the public <clears throat> on the swine flu epidemic that we hope to avoid, but it's been on everybody's mind, especially over this past weekend. And Tom, for those that don't know it, is also our health officer besides our deputy chief at the fire department. Uh, we have Speed and Oil is working on this uh, with the New Hampshire Department of Health. Tom is working on it as a health officer in conjunction with Spear and the New Hampshire Department of Health, and I'm working on it with Homeland Security. So that's the three parts that we have. The one thing that we don't want to start is any type of panic at all. This is just giving us a proactive opportunity to uh, look at what we have in place in case it were to happen, make sure that we're stocked properly and we have a plan to handle any situation of this likeness or anything else that might come at us, it's uh, actually a good tabletop exercise for us to use for the future, and hopefully we'll never get to that point. What's going to happen over the next month or so, we'll, we'll definitely start keeping the public informed almost immediately. We have some websites that the public will be able to go to. We'll put on the town's website. We'll have Jamie run it on the television, and Spears already been able to go out today and get flyers that will start having available for the public. You know, we're just asking people to use precaution as you would do with any type of flu and the three simple things are washing your hands, covering your cough and your sneeze, and avoid close contact because it's still felt that this disease is being carried through human contact. Getting caught, being in a crowded place with somebody's coughing, sneezing, uh, it's still being debated on whether it's been brought over from Mexico on airplanes and stuff like that. But the only states right now that have any cases are Mexico, California, Texas, Kansas, and New York as of this morning. And it's 
to have Tom talk in his part of it. Sure. Thank you, Paul. Here's the fact sheet that we are distributing to the public, uh, like Paul said, through the website, and we'll have it available. In fact, there's some at the back table tonight. It's available at the fire station. And that comes from DHHS's website, Department of Health and Human Services. There's a ton of information on their site, as well as CDC's site and Spears, Spear Hospital site. We had a conference call with the state today about it. Um, the communications has been real good with them. They uh, have conference calls with the emergency managers coming up, health officers, the hospitals, and they're setting one up with schools and university uh, school nurses and whatnot. In fact, there's a, a health alert network going out tonight to all the schools and universities about what precautions they should take. And it includes uh, screening individuals who have traveled to these places that Paul spoke about. Um, as of today, there were 40 cases nationwide involving five states, none in New Hampshire. And like Paul said, the danger is that it's, it's highly contagious and it does, uh, it is transmitted human to human. The symptoms are similar to uh, a regular flu, if you will. There is no vaccine, I think I said that. And there are some antivirals that do work, and I credit the feds on, uh, they're already starting to move some of those stockpiles around to make sure that the states have enough supply. There is a public hotline that was announced today by the state that we should, uh, put out to the public, it's 888-330-6764. 888-330-6764, and that's for the public uh, to answer any questions that they may have. That's staffed, I believe, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. That's all I have on that, Wish any questions? <laughs> Will I have any vaccine at any time? There isn't one at the moment. I'm sure they're working on it, but... Homeland Security and FEMA have gotten together and they've put quite a bit of money into trying to expedite a vaccine for it. Like Tom said, there isn't anything. But like Tom also mentioned, this is the quickest that I've seen Homeland Security move no, on the step of an event. I think they've that is in addition to the regular vaccine, uh, flu vaccine anybody should get in the fall. Well, there isn't one right now, but if if there was, I, I expect it would be in addition to it. Yeah. Okay. The best they can do right now is handle it the same way they handle it for. Does the university have a <coughs> program to check their we're also being touched with, Tammy Hill has a, a good program over at the university and all the entities that we usually use for any you know, town-wide, state-wide, national emergency, we keep within our emergency management loop. And then Biosphere, ourselves, and the university. That health alert network from the state went out to the universities and the schools today about how to screen students that have traveled to these places before they're allowed back in class. So that should be taking place. Tim? Just, you know, this, this whole concept, obviously, Plymouth State is an integral element of the emergency response team for this whole region or, or approach to this whole region. And the good news is we've been talking, you know, we all, all of us in this room and others have been talking about these kinds of flus for some time uh, in anticipation of these sorts of things. The one question I had is I, I know that the, what they're distributing is the Tamiflu primarily, I believe, that the feds are sending around. I just wanted to, maybe Tom, you can speak to it or somebody else can, just to let people know that that's not something you take prophylactically. You don't take it in anticipation of getting it. Right. You actually have to begin to have symptoms before you take right. it. Right, it has to be prescribed. Yeah, so I don't, it's I, a, I say that because a lot of people are thinking, oh, just run out and get that and uh, yeah. start taking it. It's <clears> not that kind of a approach to the flu. Right, it's a derivative of Tamiflu. One the antivirals that's yeah. being used. And that's, they're saying that's only good for the first 24 hours that you right. have it, and after that, you might as well just write it out. Right. Is that was, it's big. Big. Some of the other things that are being written is that some of the deaths and the other things you hear about are tend to be in, in countries that don't have the same kind of health care systems and, and other support systems that we do. So as, as horrific as it is, this is not 
of that kind of magnitude that yeah. should be too alarmed. I don't. I think Paul said the same thing. No right. panics are necessary here. Right. This was in light when we first came into these kind of practices with Asian flu and all those threats that were out there. It should never be at that magnitude. And the best thing that you could do right now is keep yourself as healthy as you can so that your immune system is up there. And if, you, if you've got a simple cold, take care of it right away. Don't, don't go to work and uh, How does pass it on security? to What's Homeland Security with that aspect of this? Is there any? How it enters the country, how it gets distributed, how Homeland Security and FEMA are basically one in the same. OK. Uh, there's and so you've already had meetings as a FEMA person? Yep, and Homeland Security. But they have Homeland Security and the Department of Homeland Security and FEMA have combined into one department. They still keep the two names, like Northrop Grumman, but they work hand in hand. Okay. So, uh, but what happens is when people hear Homeland Security, they think of terrorism and stuff like that, but they're a lot more than just handling terrorism. But anything that could enter from out of nation into the United States, it's still their responsibility to plane flights. And, uh, How many towns would we be responsible? For? What are we a hub for, in a sense? Ten. No, ten, eleven towns. Yeah, including, right. yeah, the university is in that number right. or not, I'm not sure. But they're, like Tim said, they're, they're a part of that region. Yeah. What Homeland Security allows us to do, uh, Carol, if it gets to epidemic proportions to everything, they're already to uh, release those kind of dollars that would be needed for the National Guard to kick in and start uh, using their services. And, uh, like Tom said, and I was going to get back to you with that, John, this isn't something that we can do anything about ahead of time as far as giving a vaccine to anybody. It's, uh, there is but we have to have it in place on how to <clears throat> take care of mass amount of people that come down with the disease. And, yeah. Where will they be bedded? Uh, what it will take to get supplies? You know, how many weeks will, does it take for a turnaround from an elderly person to get the flu and to get over it? And where we house these people at that time? How long is the period of flu? Is that young yet? Seven, approximately seven to ten days. Some of the young kids are bouncing flu. back and forth five days. Right. Yeah. Some of the kids are back, bouncing back and forth five days. Different populations, you know, elderly respond to it differently. Right. And, and yeah. The highest pitch thing in the air. Yeah. So it'll be our job to make sure that we have more than the manpower, the supplies that they maintain a populated area that might have to be quarantined and uh, have enough food, food, water, uh, medical supplies, not just for the flu, everything else that it takes to sustain a small population for one to two weeks. If you well, they're watching. I mean, if, if there is an outbreak, we'll know about it pretty early. Right. It hasn't gotten into New England yet, as far as we know. And it's not going to hit us by the thousands, so. I think New York is the closest. Mm -hmm. That, that is showing up briefly. Yeah. It's a cool kids are on vacation. Yeah. 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 They travel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not that anything is good about the swine flu, but like I said, we haven't had a serious threat. Now the Asian flu peaked us, and then it started to, to die off, and then you see interest started to die off. You don't see us really practice for this type of event anymore, and uh, it's time for a good practice. Hopefully that's so. all this will amount to is a good exercise of our public health networks and yeah. response capabilities. Of all the hospitals, Aware of it, there'd be an early response if it's something if something turns up. Yeah, they had a conference call with the state today, all the hospitals, right. earlier in the day. And in fact, they have a press release that uh, they put on their website tonight. They're more of them well aware, well ahead of the curve on this, and they've been in contact since early last week. I, I understand that Triple D. Uh, and you're starting to crank up again. Yeah, I was going to mention that while we're on the subject of public health, we've contracted with Dragon Mosquito again to monitor uh, for Triple E and West Nile virus. So if people see their vehicles and personnel around town, probably starting in the next month or so, that's what they're up to, trapping and testing mosquitoes. And the university and the school district are a part of that. Uh, financially, we split it three ways, for those that might not know the cost of that surveillance. 
there's a chance that we might save some money this year. Uh, I found out today they've never had a positive test in June. So the state, for example, in their, in, in their budget cuts has stopped testing in June. So when I spoke with the, the owner of Dragon Skeel today, she thought that might be prudent for us to skip June and just go from July through about the first or second frost is, is about as far as they go. So. What's the carrier? Is it mosquitoes, did you say? Yeah, biting yeah. on infected birds. And do, do they, is there anything on, on deck? Uh, is there any uh, program or anything like that? Because it, I, I noticed that there's a tremendous increase in the people that are being affected by Lyme disease. And yeah, there's a lot of information on the on that DHHS website about it. I know you know the veterinarians put out a lot of information on it too. Um, but you're right that occurrence is on the increase too of Lyme disease. I don't think sometimes somebody should should speak about how to prevent it and so forth. Yeah. We do distribute that fact sheet about this time of year through yeah. the community access channel. And it's a similar information sheet to the one I just passed out. So. I said, John, these things peak and then they oh, die off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, swine food's been working around quite a, quite a while, but it just what affects swine and now it's somehow been able to make the jump yeah. to humans. That'll be the headline. Not triple E this, yeah. this spring. This is this is going to be the headline. But the good thing is, when we're practicing for one of the, we don't practice a hundred different ways for a hundred different type of scenarios. Many of the things that we practice are, if not all, yeah. are overlapping to one yeah. uh, to extent. That's all right. Thank you. That was good. Thank you. You're welcome. Public comment. Anyone have anything to say, Frank? I have a public question. Uh, in this uh, new tree overlay upgrade, fix up the bumps and all that. Uh, who's, we're going to do anything about that little um, sinkhole at Chase Street intersection there, Main Street, when the uh, water and sewer went in to do some work uh, a while back on the water pipe leak? It. Uh, they, you know, that whatever they did, they didn't do it, something, and so now the area is sinking down, the sidewalk sinking down. And is that right at the top of the... Right at the top, right at the right sidewalk on Main Street. Market? Yeah. Frank, so, I believe that's what... I think Mike keeps including that in the area that he's looking for the sidewalks. Okay. <laughs> I, I didn't know if they were just focusing on South Main Street, but this is a particular problem. And, when it first occurred, uh, because I think it was one of the main water lines rusted and it broke and they had to come in and dig it all up, uh, it started to, the water started to flow down Chase Street itself, um, taking some of the product with it. So uh, I guess, you know, it was something between high, highway department or water and sewer, but the problem is there and I just didn't know what we haven't who's going to do what when before. The water and sewer is going to do the plenary with the storm sewers and that sort of thing. Okay. But uh, I would think with the resurfacing, they'd probably straighten the problem out. But anything that has to do with the sidewalks, we, have, we also have to check on the whole business service. Yeah. Also but I'm talking about Chase Street. You're talking about a, that's a, yeah, right course. in the street. Major yeah. in the street, it's also lowered the, uh, Sidewalk, the the uh, granite uh, curving, the bricks, yeah. everything, and it's getting worse. So. And that's what I'm saying, Charlie. We still have to look at we don't own the sidewalks. We do. We just take care of the businesses. We plow them. <laughs> Why do we plow this? Oh, you own it, John. Oh. All right. Um, anyone else? Mr. Keith. You were extended an opportunity to go out with the police chief on Spring Fling. I'd like to extend another one, which is to join our Citizens Yellow Jacket patrols, which is sort of an ambassador program. We go out and walk the streets and keep students uh, engaged and hopefully uh, following good practices. And you get to go to the concert for free and eat free pizza. 
So if you're interested in doing that, uh, just let me know and we'll issue you a yellow jacket and give you your assignments and your, your neighborhood area and love to have you. Thank you. Okay. Not all of you can do it. <laughs> and as you're all leaping to your feet to volunteer. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. We will now go into non public. Non public. RSA 91 A, colon 3, comma, Roman numeral 2, A, and C. Personal. Okay. So moved. Uh, well, say Aye. 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 Will there be any announcements at the end of the non public session? Is that anticipated? This is all work strictly legal and personnel. Okay. There will be no announcement. Only on an ongoing legal issue. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> 